you've been all over the place and uh, all over TV and uh, man, just uh, all over everywhere. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. It's been a while since we saw each other, so I guess this is a nice opportunity to catch up. It has. We, we probably only lived just a handful of miles away from each other. It seems sure. so hard to actually get together, but uh, man, awesome. I'd be grateful to have you here today. Uh, sure. And, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, I, I, people see McGregor all over the place, and they, they hear a lot of his quotes, and, uh, you know, he's really on every show you can imagine. Uh, but a lot of people don't know a lot about you behind the, the scenes and, and kind of where you came from. And one of the reasons why uh, so many people give so much credibility to uh, to you is because of your combat experience. And not, not just you you were in the military, but that you were uh, among uh, the few who have seen intense armored warfare. And especially when you're talking about this Ukraine uh, uh, Russia situation there. I mean, when you talk, it's, it's like you really do know what you say because you've done it in training and in real life. And in fact, let me just put this up on the screen here right now. Uh, when our, in the, one of the big tank battles we fought in when I was under served under Doug was the battle of seven, three Easting. And this is, this is Doug's tank. That's him there on the top uh, at the, at the culmination point, I think of the battle of seven, three Easting after he'd blown up a bunch of people and uh, led us through the uh, the big fight there, and this was his tank on the forward line there. But one one funny story about that I'll, I'll tell is uh, I remember I was in Eagle Troop, and we were kind of the the lead element in a certain part of, of the battle, and uh, and I'll never forget the uh, the uh, the one of my fellow platoon leaders in the in the net called up on the troop internal command net and was complaining to our commander and said, "Hey, can you go get Cougar Three, who was Colonel McGregor? He's now he's." Just so you know, uh, he was the the guy who was the operations officer. He's the one who, you know, directed the battle that led it. And usually, you're you know kind of on the front, but you got to be in the back so you can direct them. But not Doug at this particular moment. They were complaining that hey, Cougar Three is in front of us. He's masking our forward elements, and we can't shoot the enemy because he's up there. And uh, I, I'll just never forget that because that really really stood out to me. It's one thing to to say hey, fellas, you got to lead from the front. And it's another thing. To actually do it under fire, and uh, I've always admired you for that, Doug. And yeah, you know, well, I think I think it is HR that called me and said that I was masking the fire of his tanks because uh, they'd taken some fire from a, a building that was off to the right flank, and he wanted to shoot the building. <laughs> I can only imagine what the poor Iraqi soldier who was dumb enough to shoot at tanks uh, in the middle of a sandstorm must have thought when. Nine tanks turned around, faced the building, and shot at him. I didn't even pay attention to him. I mean, I somebody shooting a an AK or whatever was irrelevant. But people at the time said, "No, no, no, we have to do this." So, well, yeah, listen, you yeah. were there, and by the way, you know, you took that picture, and uh, you know, Dan, for for what your your viewers may not be aware of, you you were an artillery officer, and you were with uh, Eagle Troop, who I designated at that point in the battle as the main attack. You were there to essentially uh, mobilize and direct uh, indirect fire from our artillery battery of, uh, of eight guns and mortars and so forth. So you don't find very many artillerymen who are close enough to the front as you were to take a picture like that. So it works both ways. But uh, we were 1,100 men on the field with us that day. And they were. They, we were very fortunate. They were a very impressive group of people. And they manifested all the courage and competence that anyone could have wished. So I, I'm always, always very happy to uh, recollect on those times because everything depends on people. And we had very, very good soldiers. We we're very yeah. lucky. Yeah. Like we say on this channel all the time, it's, it's men, not machines that win wars. And yeah. uh, we've, we've seen that firsthand. Well, um, what's the story? What are we talking about, Dan? You know, I, I want to talk, talk first about because because you have a little bit of, uh, of a, an additional uh, title here that that uh, I think is certainly new on this channel here. But you're the the CEO of uh, our country, our choice. And uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what that is, because it's kind of new. Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the the gentleman that founded this organization, our country, our choice. Uh, and I was not one of them uh, asked me to be the CEO and essentially what they what they said we want to do is the following. We're tired of listening to this business about Republicans and Democrats. Every time we look at what's actually happening and the policies, we don't see much evidence for any real change between the two parties. 
we're tired of the uniparty. We also think there are a lot of Americans who agree with us. And so we want to reach across party lines and bring together Americans, Republicans and Democrats, independents, whatever, who essentially share our larger traditional values. And we settled on some really important issues right up front that we felt were unifying that would help us build this nationwide network that, that we're trying to create. We're also trying to create a news portal that will be fact-based news. In other words, not opinions, not shaded one way or the other, but just, just the facts. And uh, the, the battle cry is very straightforward. Uh, God, country, family, or faith, family, country, however you want to put it, that's the battle cry to get back to those very basic values. And number one, end these pointless interventions overseas that do so much damage to us, to the people we're in theory trying to help, and most of all, to our country, our economy, and to our lives. Let's put an end to it. No more, you know, wars of choice, as uh, people like to call them. Yeah. And then secondly, we, we want to restore the rule of law. You know, we're looking at what's happening across the country, not just here. You see it in Europe as well. We're indulging criminals, and it's destroying our cities. It's destroying our, our society. And with yeah. that, of course, comes the border. You know, th this border should be closed. Uh, and uh, we've got to secure it, and we've got to turn around and expel the people who are in this country illegally. We have to enforce the law. If we don't enforce it, it'll vanish, and we're, we've had it as a country. And then I think... Uh, we really want to stop the sexualization of children. We see this now on steroids. We're, we're headed down a very dangerous road when, when six and seven year olds are supposed to be able to make decisions on whether or not they want to be men or women yeah. and have these uh, sort of self mutilating uh, operations is outrageous nonsense. We think any yeah. doctor that would perform such a thing should be in jail. So the, these are the top items. They're not the only ones. Obviously, we're concerned about electoral integrity, you know, to the extent yeah. that we we can address that. We want to. Uh, and there are many, many more issues. But those are the top ones. And uh, we think we can build a lot of support for that. And we're running into lots of great people with talent and ability and skills who want to want to get involved and want to do something. The only thing they need to understand you got to exercise some patience. I mean, we the first time that we opened for business, we were not at 100%. Uh, we said we're not going to be 100% in operation until 1 November. And this is back in August. We ended up with 30,000 people. Oh, so wow. we know there's an appetite out there. And we're also seeing a lot of evidence for people overseas who are watching, people in Europe, people in India, who are saying the same thing. We need exactly this. We need this movement. It, it's, a, it's uh, you know, as, as somebody said, we, we want to save the United States. I think that's true. And we don't see much evidence that the people in Washington want to do it. Yeah. So uh, that's I where we, there's a lot of that. Yeah, because they, they, they don't want to give up their monopoly on power over, you know, they, we allegedly have a two party system. But like you call it, it's almost more like the unit party where they just exclude everybody besides who was in that game. So I'm I'm really happy to see you go down this direction. We'll be really interested to see how this develops over time. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I do want to talk about, Doug, even before we get into the, the current issues going on here, because uh, I think it's actually uh, relevant to, to some of the discussion we're about to have there. And that's when when you were uh, when President Trump uh, 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 put you in as a special advisor to the secretary of defense toward the end of his term there. Uh, as I understand it, one of the primary missions that he gave you was to end the Afghanistan war. And is, is now correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe I'm, I don't have the uh, idea completely correct. But my understanding was that the intent, his intent was to end the war, not just to pass it off to the next administration. But that was undercut. And it seems to me that if you had been able to succeed at that, we would have been able to uh, withdraw from Afghanistan in order uh, in a coherent fashion that would have left something in place that would have had a chance to succeed as opposed to that got thwarted not getting done while he was still in office. And then the chaotic way that it happened in the end could have been avoided. Is, is that close to being right? Well, I think President Trump uh, was convinced that the agreements that he had reached with the Taliban had effectively ended the war. And what he wanted to do was to get U.S. forces out. Uh, he was interested in retaining Bagram as an air base uh, and essentially as a, as a foothold where clearly we could watch what was happening in Afghanistan. And if there was a need for us to intervene, 
uh, in some way to protect our interests as well as the government's interests, then we could do so. And he agreed with me that if you're going to do this, first of all, you know, he waited too long, let's be frank, to do this. But he did agree if we're going to do this, let's do it in the winter because the winter was the ideal time to get out. Now, at the time, neither he nor I nor anybody else looking at this anticipated leaving $80 billion worth of equipment. The expectation was it would probably take us a month or more, but uh, we, we weren't going to make a big deal out of it. We were simply going to tell our allies, we'll, we'll help you leave if you want to leave, but we've decided to remove our uniform forces. And uh, we would have taken the equipment with us. We would have driven out and flown out uh, uh, virtually everything, I, I think, that we left behind. And we knew that if you did it in the winter, and you know from your experience in Afghanistan, that uh, the people that are going to give you the most trouble and attack you, they're not out in the winter. They're, right. they're at home in the cave or somewhere else trying to stay warm. So if you got to pick a time, that's it. Don't wait for the fighting season. And, of course, that's what we did. You know, we, we, we waited. But... You know, President Trump, sadly, I waited too long to act. And then secondly, he discovered he had too many people against him, not just uh, on the Hill, some people that were in his administration who actively subverted him and undermined him, treated him with complete contempt and disrespect. And then, of course, the Pentagon. And there was nobody over there interested in ending the cash machine. They wanted that to go on in perpetuity. And if you look at the cast of characters that were there, that ultimately removed uh, our presence, if you will, they were the same people that were there under President Trump. And, and I think they, it would have gone better under President Trump, but it still would have been problematic because uh, they're just awful, awful generals. I mean, I can't imagine a, a more unimpressive collection of military leaders than were assembled to do it. And why would you do it from Kabul airport? I mean, that, that's just insane. Yeah, you know, I, I, I generally never understood how it is that the commander in chief of the U.S. Armed Forces said, this is what I want to happen. And then the Pentagon says, yeah, about that. Uh, like there was a choice in the matter. And that's kind of how it worked. And I just don't understand how that is able to be able to manifest it and nobody get held accountable or, or, or uh, you know. Well, remember, that. remember that McKenzie, who was the commander in CENTCOM, was always very much in the let's go to war with Iran camp. So he was, uh, you know, very close to Bolton and Pompeo and others. So he was not at all sympathetic to, in any way, shape, or form, anything that President Trump wanted to do, least of all ending conflicts and wars. But then, you know, that, that's one problem. But the larger problem, in my estimation, is Milley. Because Milley was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs commands nothing. His job is very clearly explained in uh, Title X. And what does it say? It says that he is the senior military advisor to the president. He's the one who walks in and says, Mr. President, I wouldn't do that. Or if you're going to do that, then you might want to consider this. And, oh, Mr. President, I have reviewed the plans. I know what they're going to do. I don't think they'll work, or I do think they'll work. You know, the last president that went through some something like this as a debacle, of course, was John F. Kennedy. Yeah. And uh, he went to the, the Bay of Pigs catastrophe. And where was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs? Where were the Joint Chiefs? They all sat it out because they was well, a CIA's problem. I mean, imagine that. Uh, I'm surprised that in addition to following Alan Dulles, he didn't fire the whole bunch. Uh, you yeah. know, and so this, this was another example of that sort of thing. And if we get a president who is not part of the uniparty, who is not part of the swamp, who is not part of the problem. And I don't know that there that's a certainty at this point by any means. But if we do, whether it's Donald Trump or potentially RFK Jr., uh, both of them are going to have to go into this and understand that this town is occupied territory and they are foreigners and they are going to have to fight and you, you fight by eliminating your enemies and replacing them with people who are loyal to you and loyal to your agenda. And people who are not swampists, if you will. Right. So yeah. I, I don't know how that's going to work out. I have no idea at this point. But anybody yeah. who thinks that you just elect somebody and they're going to save you is crazy. That's not yeah. going to work. Yeah, it's, it seems like that's the way it's supposed to work. You, you elect somebody and you elect their foreign policy vision. And then it's supposed to be that the government apparatus will then put into effect 
what the vision that president or that person has. And yet, uh, as you point out, that's that's not what's really going on behind the scenes. They have to fight the inside before they can even talk about executing policies you know, on the outside. And that's a uh, that's a problem that we uh, we maybe we should talk about that one in more depth on another day. Yeah. Uh, but I want to try to shift gears real quick because uh, I know your time's valuable here. Uh, one thing I want to talk about specifically is another thing you've got some very demonstrative uh, expertise on. Uh, a few years back, you published this book here, Margin of Victory, where you talk about uh, basically how uh, successful armies are built, not not just how fights are won, but uh, uh, battles are won, but how uh, effective armies are built. And, and that's really important to what we're doing right now, especially in, in the issue of Ukraine in its war there. And I, I want to read just a real short piece here and get you to uh, kind of tell us a little bit about how this applies to the situation of what the U.S. is trying to do with the Ukrainian army. In, uh, in this book, you said uh, each chapter of the book is a clarion call for the United States to recognize that wars are decided in the decades before they begin, not by the sudden appearance of a new technology, a silver bullet, or the presence of a few strong personalities in the senior ranks during a senior battle, a single battle. Uh, <clears throat> how effectively national political and military leaders adjust the framework of organization, technology, and human capital in the relentless change in society, technology, and world affairs determines whether the nation state prevails or perishes in defeat. Now, if it's true that war, that effective armies are formed in the decades prior to the war starting, then upon what basis can the United States be saying that we're trying to form a Ukrainian army on the fly under under pressure, under fire with basically spare parts from like 50 different nations. Upon what basis do we think that's going to work and what's really going to happen? Well, I think you've answered the question. Nothing good is going to happen. I think Ukraine, the Ukrainian state is effectively dead. I think the war militarily is, is frankly over. Uh, but let's go back very briefly to what you mentioned to begin with. When you and I and millions of others, well, not millions, but hundreds of thousands of others were in the Middle East, and everyone was so impressed with how we performed, how the Army performed, and, and how we did in particular, that was not a function of what you and I and the rest of us did on that particular day. Sure, we had a, an impact. We had to pull the triggers. We had to fight and so forth. But we were the product uh, of efforts that began in the early 1970s, in the in, in the aftermath of Vietnam, when the United States Army was in ruins, and very very dedicated, devoted, and, and intelligent people at high levels sat down and said, "We've got to build a new force, and we've got to start from scratch." And they were right, and uh, they built a very fine force with the insights that they gleaned from studying the previous hundred years of. Uh, U.S. And, and foreign military history. They went to Israel, they went to Russia, they went all over the place, and they learned a great deal, and they came back, and it, it made a difference. So that we were able to do on the 26th of February 1991 what we did, largely because of those decisions, personnel decisions, tactics, doctrine, organization. So 1991 and 1971 are about 20 years apart. And this really got started in 1975. So we're looking at a decade and a half of systematic reform, reorganization, and change to produce an outcome that was successful. Fast forward to Ukraine, and we began trying to train the Ukrainians in earnest to fight the Russians about 2014. We kept encouraging them to do so. They, As soon as the Maidan coup had occurred, they began shelling the Russians in Donetsk and, and Luhansk, the so-called breakaway provinces, simply because those people were Russians and they didn't like the coup and they were afraid of what it meant for them. And they were right. They didn't want to be treated as second class citizens. They wanted equality before the law. They wanted to be treated as human beings. They were not. The Ukrainians treated them as essentially a cancer to be cut out of the country. So it began very quickly. We then began pouring resources and people in. And you can do many good things in a relatively short period of time, but to build a force to take on a, a great power in the space of five, six, or seven years is absurd. And so the Ukrainians ended up fighting courageously and dying in great numbers as a result. And this has turned into, in my view, an atrocity.
for which we and our European allies are responsible. Because for some time now, I would argue certainly since January, the Russians have been in a position where if they wanted to launch a major offensive, they could do so. And that offensive could, could turn out to be very destructive and go straight to the Dnieper River. They've chosen not to do that. Now, part of that is because, as you and I know, the Ukrainians, very sadly, have, have obliged the Russians by imp impaling themselves right. on impregnable defense. Well, whose fault is that? Who the hell is advising these people? You know, the intelligent thing to do once those defenses were established was to say, it's time to back up. We need to build secondary lines of defense for ourselves. These people aren't going to sit there forever. So we need to do that. And then we need to re-examine how we're organized to fight and what other kinds of equipment you're going to need. We didn't do that. Yeah. We said, we're we, 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 we have an answer to one of your questions there, Doug, and I wanted to get your comment on this. Uh, we do have uh, uh, one of our favorite guys uh, we have here uh, from Brother David Petraeus. Uh, he had this to say in July about the, about the offensive and about what the prognosis was for success. They've adapted, I think, impressively. Uh, now, their achievements have been pretty modest. They've certainly uh, cleared, liberated over 100 square miles. That's not much, although it is more uh, in the first seven weeks of this offensive than the Russians achieved in the previous seven months of their fall and winter offensive. I think the key is going to be whether Russian forces can hold up. They've been in the line for over a year. They're not rotating forces the way the Ukrainians are. They're not that well looked after. And will they crack? Might they crumble? Might it be more than just local? That, I think, is going to be a, a very important factor in whether the Ukrainian offensive achieves the success that, that many of us are hoping that they will achieve. Now, uh, I think on May 31st, so before the offensive was launched, Petraeus came out on BBC and was really optimistic and said, boy, you're going to see this big combined arms operation where they got tanks and artillery and infantry and they're going to have mine breaching equipment. And you're going to see, I think, that the Russian defense just collapsed, I think, is what they're going to do. And now that he's somewhat moderating that on July 31st and well, now then since then, almost nothing has happened. I mean, they they barely dented the line anywhere and yet you still see them saying, I, I think Petraeus is actually going to say in five days from now in a foreign policy uh, magazine uh, affair that, you know, hey, everybody, you know, they're not really lost now. Things are going better than we think. Even still, he keeps saying that it's going to work. And Doug, how can people say that when they see with their own eyes that the line hasn't moved and the casualty counts have, they continue to rise. How do people like this keep getting credibility? You'll remember that uh, in uh, December 1990, when we were in the desert where we had Christmas, uh, that the regiment had sent us a lot of engineering assets, bulldozers and so forth. And we were directed to dig in our combat equipment, our tanks and Bradleys and so forth. And I refused to do it. I just said, I told Robinette, who's the deputy regimental commander, I'm not going to do it. And of course, the troop commanders, everybody was there, you know, Sproul, Sardiano, McMaster, we all thought that was crazy. You know, why would you dig in a tank that's designed to attack potentially at 50 miles per hour? I mean, there's, a, you know, we built this thing to attack on the move. Why would we do that? Well, make a long story short, I took all those assets and I, I went to the Sergeant Major Catching. Uh, you remember Sergeant Major Catching's one wonderful, wonderful man. He passed away sadly, got killed in an automobile accident. Oh, Not a good way for a soldier to die. And Sherman Ketchings, tall, distinguished-looking black man, I said, uh, Sergeant Major, what the hell do you think we should do with this junk? And he said, why don't we dig in the talk, the Tactical Operations Center? And I burst out laughing. I said, yeah, I don't, if I could, I'd leave that junk here when we go to war anyway. Because it was slow and ponderous. It was sort of a traveling circus on on tracks. Anyhow, so he, d he dug this thing that looked like the Holland Tunnel, you know, and then drove everything into it. Well, that turned out to be a hit. Everybody loved it. We camouflaged it and so forth. And everybody came from far and wide to see this stupid thing dug into the desert. So then the regimental commander says, well, you know, we want to use your talk to brief the chief of staff of the army and the vice chief who are coming at Christmas. I said, OK, that's fine. You know, so comes to Christmas Day. And unfortunately, I had eaten something I shouldn't have, which happens to us in the desert. And I got violently ill. But I 
I recovered to get up and go over to where the briefing is. I didn't want to go into the briefing in case I had to go. Bleh. So uh, anyhow, guess who was there? Major David Petraeus. I did aide, not remember that. <laughs> aide de camp, no, you didn't see him. Aide de camp to the chief of staff of the army. Now remember, David already being an aide de camp twice, or at least once, to uh, General Galvin, who ended up being the uh, the supreme commander of Europe at NATO. So now he's an uh, aide de camp to the chief of staff. So I walked over and I said, "Hello, David. Oh, hi, Doug. How you doing?" And I said, "Well, David, I'm glad to see you here. I'm a little concerned about you know what I'm seeing at." seventh corps he said what do you mean i said well they're moving awfully slowly and once this war begins i we need to sweep across that desert at high speed and you know annihilate this republican guard and put ourselves behind the enemy and we, we this is not the time to be timid not the time to be slow i'm worried about that oh doug i wouldn't worry about that i think everything's just going to be fine now you'll excuse me i got to work with doug loot over here and take care of these uh, two four-star generals, and off they went. Well, you know the rest of the story. The Republican Guard largely escaped through no fault of ours, and uh, we, ended up, we ended up going back, which should not have been the case. But the point is that Dave hasn't done anything. And if you go to Iraq and you follow this book that was written by, I forgot if it was Ricks or, the, or one of the others, about Petraeus in Iraq, they were asked, well, was he ever under fire? And they said, well, there was a mortar round that dropped about 100 yards away. Uh, you know, that's not his world. And he is simply repeating two things. He repeats this doctrine from the army, which is irrelevant. Uh, it's, it's 30, 40 years old, and it doesn't make any sense. He talks about combined arms operations. Well, the Germans invented that. That's fine. Yeah. We're dealing with a different form of warfare right now, who, by the way, the Russians pioneered starting in the 1970s with the uh, reconnaissance strike platform. I mean, this is the basis for a lot of the things I subsequently wrote. The Russians are annihilating everything where they have persistent surveillance. These links are exceptional. And so he makes these statements on one, one level from ignorance. And then the, the other part of it is that you got to look at who's paying his salary where he's working now and what he did while he was on active duty. The people that sponsored him for promotion, the people that are paying his salary now are the same people that dragged us into all of these wars and want us to go to war in, or wanted us to go to war with a vengeance in Ukraine. And, and they want him to say what he's saying and he's going to say them. You know, it's an old expression. You know, you go home with the girl you brought to the dance. Well, somebody brought him to the dance and he's going to go home with them no matter what. But you know, Doug, I mean, the, but the, you, you can't keep saying stuff like that that proves out to be just catastrophically wrong. I mean, because Why not? Why they're, not? they're not going forward. No, no, you're wrong. I hate to say this, but you're wrong. And if you look at the people in Washington, people have been saying for 30, 40 years that illegal immigration is a serious problem. People have argued for security oh. on that border for decades. Now that it's become a national crisis that threatens to bankrupt states and cities, and criminality is on the rise. So, oh, well, we need to do this. It's the same principle. And the diehards that believe in open borders because they think this is going to give them a new voter base to keep them in power forever, they're not going to admit that this was a mistake. It's impossible. No one in Washington ever admits that anything they said or did was wrong. Now, now speaking <laughs> of that, there, there may be a slight changing of it. Let me show you uh, the two clips put together here uh, by John Kirby. Now, one of these is at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the year, actually, when he was emphatic that we were going to stay with Ukraine as long as it takes until yesterday when there was a slight change. Watch this. What do you mean by that? As long as they need. What do you mean by that? What win winning looks like for we were in, uh, in Ukraine? Well, as long as it takes means as, as long as it takes. And it means that I'm unable uh, to give you a date certain calendar uh, for, you know, when, uh, you know, when uh, that support won't be necessary anymore. It's necessary now. It's going to be necessary in coming weeks and months for certain. And we want to make sure that we're meet you, meeting the need as best we can uh, for Ukraine. And you had what does winning look like? President Zelensky gets to determine, gets to determine uh, what victory looks like. But in the near term, we've, we've got appropriations and authorities for both Ukraine and for Israel. But 
you don't want to be trying to bake in long-term support when you're at the end of the rope. And uh, in Ukraine, on the Ukraine funding, we're, we're coming near to the end of the rope. So we're coming near to the end of the rope. I mean, all this time for as long as it takes and no strings attached to all of a sudden, now it's not Zelensky that gets to make the call that our rope's coming to an end. So Zelensky is going to be cut loose here pretty soon because now we're actually running low on ammunition and we don't have a bunch of 5,000 more vehicles to give away. And I think that the, uh, the, the bill is coming due here, but there's definitely coming a change here because we recognize that we can't keep the fiction up anymore. I think that's what's happening. Well, <clears throat> I think you're right. And I'm sure that his admission was, to put it bluntly, accidental. Uh, it's not something you want to advertise. But let's be frank, we're $33 trillion in debt. The debt payment, servicing payment on an annual basis is equal to or greater than the defense budget. The defense budget, uh, if you crank in the uh, intelligence agencies, is about a trillion dollars every year. We can't afford that. Uh, we can't afford to keep sustaining Ukraine, and we're going to have a tough time trying to help Israel. We, we cannot print money in perpetuity without consequences. All you have to do is look at the treasury market, look at the 10-year treasury and the rise in the yield, and, and look at who's buying our bonds. Here's a, here's a hint. Very few people want to buy our bonds. If you can't get people to buy the bonds, well, that's not a problem. The Fed will buy them. No, it's not going to work anymore. I think, I think he's really saying that more than anything else. We can't afford it. It's beyond our means. Now, what do you say to the Ukrainians? I'm sure the Ukrainians would like to take the rope and, and hang him and his friends uh, after what they've done to Ukraine. Because remember, Zelensky was ready to sign on for neutrality and a deal that came yep. at the end of March, beginning of April. And we remember our friend, the blowhard, Boris Johnson, who flies in on behalf of Biden and says, oh, no, 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 don't do that. We will supply you with whatever you need. We'll give you everything. You'll have the combined scientific industrial power of the entire NATO alliance behind you, and you will win. He was ready to sign on for the deal with the neutrality. He did. He said so publicly before that meeting and changed so, uh, it soon after it. Yeah, so we know, we know that uh, he was told not to, and here we are. Uh, now Ukraine, I argue, is a, almost a dead nation. And the only thing that saves Ukraine from complete and utter destruction at this point is President Putin, who has exercised incredible restraint. He, neither he nor the Russians are anything that people have said about them in the Western media. And uh, he's, this, this restraint will not last forever because at some point he wants to bring this to an end. He would prefer a negotiated settlement. And this is why, you know, my concern is if you keep this up, you'll get the thing that you said you didn't want. Hundreds of thousands of Russian troops on the Polish border. But he doesn't want to go there. He knows the Western Ukrainians don't want to be ruled by Russians. Right. He's not interested in it. It never was. There's no interest in conquering Eastern Europe. Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Poles, yeah. Western Ukrainians. Nobody wants the Russians there. He knows that. He doesn't want to go there. Yeah, he didn't even have the capacity to go there or the ability to hold on to it if he did. So it's it's not even, in my view, not even possible. Yeah, and, and today, when you look at the Russian military, it is more powerful and capable today than it was in the 1980s. It's up to a million men. It's going to go to 1.2. The equipment is superb. The factories are churning this stuff out faster than they can equip people. But the bottom line is that wasn't the case in February 2020, exactly. as you point out. At that point, this was the relatively small force that he had designed for homeland defense. And instead, people pour buckets of filth and abuse all over the Russians, accusing them of wanting to conquer Eastern Europe. It's a lot of nonsense. Yeah, it's it has to sense. stop. Americans need to wake up. They will wake up, but they're going to wake up to a, to a, a dramatic fall in their standard of living. They're going to wake up to higher oil prices that are going to wreak havoc with us. They're going to say, well, what happened to all the refineries? What happened to all the oil rigs? What happened to the natural gas? What happened to the fracking? It's going to take us years to recover from the damage we've done to ourselves by essentially eliminating those things. I mean, California 40 years ago had 43 refineries. Today, California has less than 20. And they can't wait to get rid of them. 
you know, this, this cart before the horse with the new green deal is going to kill us all. It's killing Germany. It's doing irreparable harm to us. It's all got to stop. It will, but until yeah. it stops, everybody's going to suffer. Right. And, and, you know, and on this issue there with the, uh, with the Ukrainians and, and, you know, the, everything that you had that Kirby had there in the first part of that uh, clip, as well as you know, obviously president Biden stuff. We, I, I believe that time is going to show that we gave false hope to Ukraine that we, as you just mentioned there about the, the deal that we did make in March, uh, 2022, when we had it on the table and could have prevented a lot more death is that eventually because of what you have in, in this book about how it takes to build an army, you can't do it on the fly under fire while you're losing people left and right is that the natural result is going to be a loss and, and it could have been avoided. And now then we're going to have the very things that we say we wanted to avoid, as you just, you just mentioned there. And so many thousands of Ukrainian men and women and civilians are, have paid the price because we wouldn't do what made sense in the beginning. There's, I think one, other, be the, there's one other point. point. There's one other point I would leave with you and your audience, if I may. Germany will emerge from this terrible experience much more sober-minded. I think the NATO alliance will just crumble. Uh, you know, it's one of those things Henry James said, uh, sacred cows are never slain, they simply vanish. Uh, NATO will not be slain, it will simply vanish. And the Ukrainian, or excuse me, the Germans will form a relationship with Russia that is both beneficial to them and the Russians economically, and ultimately militarily. The very thing that we were most concerned about is going to happen. Germany, the real powerhouse in Europe, will build good relations with Russia as a result of this. We need to wake up and understand that we don't rule the, West, the Eastern Hemisphere, that we are dominant in the Western Hemisphere, but not in the Eastern Hemisphere. We need to get along with the other great powers. If we don't get along with them and do business with them, eventually we'll be at war with them and we will not win it. Yeah, and we definitely can't afford that. Doug, we're almost out of time here, but I don't want to miss this last point here because it's about to really hit the fence. Again, in terms of that it takes 10 years to form an army before it goes into combat, what are your thoughts on, on what Israeli defense forces are facing if they do, in fact, launch an incursion into Gaza? The Israelis are confronted with a very unsavory uh, requirement, and that is to go in and root out the enemy in Gaza. Uh, they are assembling a force of 470,000 men, which is larger than the regular army of the United States. And it will certainly take tens of thousands of combat troops to do what they want to do. Unfortunately, these are reservists. And in many cases, they haven't had as much training as the reservists did in 73 when they were called up to fight. Uh, they're going to take a lot of casualties if they do this. But there's something else that, that needs to be borne in mind. Right now, the Israeli leadership is ruled by emotion. They are understandably horrified by what happened. Yeah. Everybody is. Everybody knows that. But the people at the top need to be rational. Reason must triumph over emotion. They need to look carefully at the consequences of their actions. Because the Middle East is not the Middle East that it was 20 years ago. And this is a, a, an ugly event but if the Israelis go in there and ethnically cleanse Gaza, throwing all of these millions of people under the bus, so to say, especially in the onset of winter, it'll, it'll never completely happen because the region will go to war with them. And everybody keeps focusing on Iran. As, as uh, Sullivan said, they had no role in triggering this. We need to understand that Qatar funds Hamas, not Iran. And then secondly, Qatar also funds Turkey. And the Turks are the real power. That's the 800-pound gorilla in the corner in the Middle East. And Mr. Erdogan is watching this unfold very carefully. You recall it's a few years ago, there was an incident in which the Israelis seized a ship carrying aid to Gaza that was a Turkish ship. And two Turkish citizens, at least two, were killed. The Turks have not forgotten. And I would watch my northern border carefully. It's not only Hezbollah. It can be worse than that. And let's hope that Egypt remains neutral. And I hope the Israelis do nothing to change that because that's vital to Israeli survival and national security. Yeah, anyway. that's, that's one of the things that really concerns me, that this has the potential 
to really explode. And we've got to keep this contained and get it over with as quickly as possible, or it's going to be bad, much worse for Israel and bad for us as well. Doug, I appreciate your time. Uh, we definitely want to have you back. I can't wait till we have you again. And I know your time's valid, but uh, thank you so much for coming on our show today. Sure. Thank you, Dan. I